Good evening and welcome. My name is Brian Daves. I'm a professor of political science here at Stern College for Women at Yeshiva University. And I direct the Dr. Robbins, Marsha Robbins Wolf Scholar in Residence Program. And I want to welcome you all on behalf of the university. And I also want to thank a couple of people for making this evening's uh, event possible. First, uh, Dr. Marsha Robbins Wolf, um, who's a member of the Stern College uh, for Women Board and who has uh, generously um, endowed this lecture series. Uh, doc Dr. Uh, Karen Bacon, who's the Dean of Stern College for Women, as well as a number of other people who work very hard, uh, both in the Dean's office as well as the, uh, the facilities uh, staff, as well as the um, public affairs um, office. Welcome. Uh, this is a part of an ongoing lecture series that we do at uh, Stern College on uh, public and international affairs um, issues. And uh, we welcome you and hope that you'll be able to join us again in the future. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about um, toppling uh, Middle East dictators that has st started in Tunisia um, and has continued in Egypt and now has spread, protests have spread in other parts of the Arab world. Um, and is now involving the United States militarily in uh, Libya. And we have um, two guests with us this evening that I can't think of, um, two people that are possibly more informed than these two to um, discuss uh, the events in the Middle East and the U.S. Uh, reaction to it and the implications for U.S. policy. Uh, first, uh, to my left or to your right is um, uh, Jamie Rubin, who's the executive editor of the Bloomberg View, and he is also the president of the Amer American Atlantic Partnership U.S. and a uh, commentator on U.S. foreign policy and world affairs. He was assistant secretary of state for public affairs and chief spokesman for the State Department from 1997 to 2000, and he was a top policy advisor to Secretary of State Mad Madeleine Albright and acted as a special negotiator during the Kosovo War to secure the demobilization of the Kosovo Liberation Army. From 2000 to 2008, Mr. Rubin worked in London as a broadcaster, professor, commentator, and uh, financial communications strategist. During this time, he was an anchor and world affairs commentator for Sky News, a visiting professor of international relations at the London School of Economics. Um, he also was a host of uh, a PBS series called Wide Angle. And in 2004, Mr. Rubin served as a senior advisor for national security for the Kerry Edwards campaign. And in 1996, he was the director of foreign policy for the Clinton Gore campaign in 1996. He's also served as an adjunct professor at Columbia University's School of International Public Affairs. And he has received that university's John Jay Award for Distinguished Professional Achievement. And at the State Department, he received its highest honor, the Distinguished Service Award. He received a bachelor's degree in political science and a master's degree in international affairs from Columbia University. He's written for the New York Times. <laughs> I'm sorry? No, it's just embarrassing for me. That's <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, he's written, written op-ed pieces for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Herald Tribune, and the Financial Times, the New Republic. Um, to his left is David Sanger, who's the chief uh, Washington correspondent from the New York Times, uh, who, where he has worked for over two decades, including six years as chief White House correspondent. Um, he has twice been a member of uh, New York Times reporting teams that has won the Pulitzer Prize. And his reporting on Iraq and North Korea during the nuclear crisis won the Weintal Prize, one of the highest honors for foreign policy coverage. In uh, this past year, in 2010, he was instrumental in selecting and reporting on the stories published by the Times on the classified documents released by WikiLeaks. He contributed a chapter on what we learned from WikiLeaks about American diplomacy in the Times' new book, Open Secrets. And he is also the author of a New York Times bestseller, The Inheritance, uh, the, Obama, the, the World Obama Confronts and the Challenges to American Power. He regularly appears on national public radio shows and on television, including Washington, Charlie Rose, and Face the Nation. And he's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. And he's a graduate of Harvard College. In 2010, he was appointed an adjunct professor of public policy at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, where he's also a non-resident um, scholar. So welcome to Jamie Rubin and David Sanger.
So I, where I thought we would start is to possibly start at what some have described as being the beginning of all this, which is the WikiLeaks that supposedly brought about um, embarrassment for some leaders in the al our world, particularly President Ben Ali of, of Tunisia, and um, supposedly brought about, or some have suggested is brought about um, his departure from power. And since uh, David was uh, involved in the reporting on WikiLeaks, I thought we would start with him. Oh, well, thank you very much, and thank you uh, for uh, uh, having, uh, having me here uh, at Yeshiva. It's the first time I've uh, uh, been to Yeshiva uh, as, a, as a speaker, and I'm uh, delighted uh, I've already had a chance to meet a number of the students, and it's really been a terrific event. And it's wonderful to be here with my old friend and sparring partner, Jamie. Uh, there was an era in life when I was uh, uh, covering things in Diplomatic, and uh, Jamie and I would be on the phone every afternoon, and I miss those. You may not, but, <laughs> but I do. Uh, the um, WikiLeaks was an extraordinary uh, experience for us, um, in part because uh, I can't remember a time in the nearly 29 years I've, I've been at the Times We've dealt with a lot of leaked material. We've never dealt with leaked material on this scale. And of course, one of the first decisions we had to go make was uh, whether or not we would publish it and then under what conditions. And uh, we didn't just take this material and throw it out into, into the open. We went through it with great care. Uh, we redacted uh, a number of things, uh, particularly uh, the names of individuals who were either sources of the U.S. government or uh, people who were uh, clearly working for uh, the U.S. government or intelligence agencies. We redacted uh, anything about ongoing operations. Uh, and we got into a very lengthy uh, discussion and debate with the Obama administration, which I'll be happy to discuss in greater detail if it's of interest to anybody. Uh, about what we should publish or not. And it wouldn't surprise you that the Obama administration uh, going in position was that none of it should be published, that it was all classified material and therefore uh, should all uh, remain secret. Our position at the beginning of this was, look, whether the New York Times publishes this or not, it's getting out there because we were not the only one to have it. Obviously, WikiLeaks itself was getting ready to publish. They've only published a few thousand of them. Der Spiegel, The Guardian. One thing that we would not accede to the uh, government's uh, uh, urgings not to publish was information that was merely embarrassing. We said we wouldn't do sources, we wouldn't do things that we thought had a high chance of getting people captured or killed. But if a foreign leader had said something that they simply didn't want to be quoted saying, or an observation was made about a group of foreign leaders, that we thought was news, and that the damage would probably, we thought, be relatively limited and of a short duration. Um, so for example, you read in WikiLeaks that the king of Saudi Arabia told the United States that in relation to Iran and its nuclear program, he believed that the US needed to cut off the head of the snake. You heard that the king of Bahrain, who now has other problems on his hands, was very concerned and believed that the United States should actually bomb the Iranian nuclear sites. In the case of Tunisia, we didn't even run the, the cables that we had seen on Tunisia. I wish I, could say, I wish I could say that proudly, but frankly, we were looking for big strategic countries and what we learned about them. Afghanistan, Iraq, China, Israel, the list went on. We didn't spend a very much time looking at Tunisia. But others did, and other publications ran them. And what the Tunisians read in those cables were the wry observations of US diplomats. And by the way, if these cables proved anything, it proved that US diplomats are actually pretty good writers. Um, which shocked our British friends. Um, but uh, what we learned was that US diplomats were reporting back about the high lifestyle of President Ben Ali, and particularly his wife. And the whole image of them sitting by the pool with caviar and champagne, while everybody else out in the country was making $2 a day, 
um, was a pretty sharp contrast. Now, the Tunisians knew all of this, but there are some U.S. officials who believe that reading that American officials knew about it and were reporting it back to Washington was particularly embarrassing and helped become one of the sparks. Now, we'll never know, and I've heard this argued many different ways, but I think it is fair to say that it was some form of contributing factor, just as in Egypt, Facebook was some form of contributing factor, but you can't quantify it. And as far as the impact on WikiLeaks for the conduct of uh, American foreign policy, particularly for public diplomacy, with which you had a um, great deal of experience with, how much damage did it cause? Well, I, I appreciate David's point of view as a journalist uh, receiving uh, documents of this type and, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of secret and confidential documents, uh, the kind of thing that journalists across the board are thrilled to read and will either confirm or add to their knowledge that they've been reporting on uh, for years and years. So. It, it didn't surprise me that the New York Times and The Guardian and, um, and Le Monde, I guess, and, and Der Spiegel, uh, in addition to WikiLeaks, put these cables out there and reported on them. I wish I could say that, that the care the New York Times took was, was uniform across the, the board. I suspect that over time a lot of these documents will find their way into the public domain and some of the individuals who may have been uh, uh, protected by some newspapers may not in the end be as protected. But more broadly, I think it is a, a misjudgment to minimize the damage to American diplomacy. I think uh, I just, in, in the nature of our friendly banter we used to have, I think you are uh, minimizing the damage that WikiLeaks did. And I say that because I was the interface between the U.S. government and, and journalists on specific issues where classified information became known. And uh, it's inevitable, it's part of the process, and the public does have a certain right to know. And, and even when the Iraq and the Afghanistan set of cables were out there, arguably if you were an anti-war person and you wanted to show the Afghanistan war had these problems or the Iraq war had those problems, you know, putting out these documents could add to your argument. I think, in fact, what we discovered is that the journalism was pretty good, and we knew most of the things in the Iraq and Afghanistan uh, reports. But to widespread dump every subject matter in the U.S. State Department's uh, library, essentially what happened was a librarian gave to uh, a, um, a, a uh, military uh, a member of the military, the library of a set of certain type of documents at a certain classification, not the highest, but significant. And the library was put into the public domain. And the result is a very real, very long-lasting, not short duration, reluctance on the part of important countries, officials, uh, leaders, uh, and individuals to share their views, their statements, their knowledge with American diplomats. As it turns out, last night I was at a dinner with the Prime Minister of a country very important to the United States right now. And this is months and months after WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks hasn't been in the newspaper for a long, long time, and believe me, this country has other problems, a Middle Eastern country. And this came up, and he said, we talk to Americans differently now. Now, individually, at the ambassadorial level, a you know, system has probably been developed to, to de reestablish a certain trust. But from the ambassador level and the president level and the secretary of state level down to the lowest foreign service officer, a massive breach of confidentiality has occurred, and I believe it will take years not days or weeks, to have the uh, equivalent level of trust reestablished between uh, people we in the United States state uh, government, I'm not in it anymore, but we as American, uh, Americans used to gain information. And all for the purposes of I'm not sure, and that's my point. If it was to stop a war and, and there is a principle, a higher principle like, say, the Pentagon Papers or or, uh, you know, civil rights or some great issue of conscience that justifies this, this 
breach of, of uh, the law and, and, and classification, then I think one can make a pretty good argument that public has a right to know. But to just across the board uh, say, OK, what the State Department says and does now uh, is up for grabs for the whole world, because once it's on the internet, it is the whole world, good, bad, and indifferent. So my view is that we learned not that much about uh, many of these issues because of the good reporting of David and many other people about the issue of Iran, about the issue of Iraq and Afghanistan. And we did grievous, grievous long-term harm. Not fatal, but real, and has tended to be dismissed by uh, people who don't really understand the daily functioning. David is, I'm not saying he's dismissed it, he's made a judgment that it's short term and, and I just dis mm -hmm. differ. And in, in terms of David's reference to some in uh, Washington thinking that this had some role to play for uh, the downfall of Tunisia, of uh, the Tunisian president, Ben Ali, um, besides, besides the concern about yeah. the effect on on the relationships that American diplomats are going to have with their interlocutors, how much of an effect do you think that this actually had? Um, I don't think uh, you know you could put it in the category of, of 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 substantial major. I would guess the phrase term of art in Washington would be non-trivial, mm -hmm. meaning it wasn't nothing. Uh, but I think, as David pointed out, they knew this stuff. Um, the youth uh, uh, anger across the Middle East was building for a very long time. Obviously, in Tunisia, there was a specific incident that generated uh, the initial uh, protest. And once that dynamic starts of protest and response, and, and for the first time, people in that part of the world saw that their standing up and being counted had an impact. I think it was a snowball. Uh, did this push the snowball down the hill at a certain point? Maybe it was slowing down probably a little bit, but I, I wouldn't exaggerate it. I just wanted to uh, just pick up for a moment on two things that Jamie said that I think were very interesting and worth airing out a, a bit more. Um, first, I agree with you completely, Jamie, that dumping this out unedited would do enormous harm. And what I found interesting is that when the Times, which did not get this from Julian Assange, we were given it by The Guardian, and I think we were given it by The Guardian in part because The Guardian and Der Spiegel knew that The Times would be able to have a conversation that they probably couldn't with the U.S. government about what was damaging and what was not. We went through a lengthy process. It's described in a in a uh, long magazine piece that Bill Keller, our executive editor, uh, uh, published a few months ago. It's also the introduction to Open Secrets, which you mentioned, the, the Times book on this. And um, in the course of those discussions, we agreed to do some redactions. We agreed to hold back a couple of documents that involved uh, ongoing operations. And then we passed our decisions on to Der Spiegel and to the Guardian. They had to make their own judgments. And they passed them on to, uh, to WikiLeaks. Der Spiegel and the Guardian pretty much did every redaction that we had decided on. And to our surprise, WikiLeaks did most of them. And even if you go on the WikiLeaks site today, out of the 250,000 documents that are out there in the database, only a few thousand have been published. So. I agree with you. A few thousand is an awful lot. <laughs> okay. Okay. However, um, these were coming out anyway, and I think had the Times not gotten involved, and some other responsible journalistic organizations, I think the damage probably would have been much greater. Now that said, there has been some real damage. We've seen in the past two or three weeks alone, the American ambassador to Mexico and the American ambassador to Ecuador, both leaving their posts uh, because things they published bec th that they had written in cables or had come out of their embassies were so um, difficult for their host governments to accept. Um, and so I think that there is real damage to it. When I said that I didn't think that that was long-term damage, I meant that I didn't think it would go on for many, many years. I didn't mean many, many weeks. Um, however, 
Uh, I think it's also possible that when we look back at this period of time, depending on how we make judgments about things like Tunisia, you may come to the determination that it had some unintended effects that may not have all been negative. And you're actually beginning to hear that a little bit in your old hallways in the State Department. Well, let's, let's now shift this to what the implications for the Middle East are. So the United States not nearly as concerned about Ben Ali leaving Tunisia as they were about protests spreading in places like Egypt and the fall of um, Hosni Mubarak. And there was quite a bit of discussion and, and debate about the way in which the Obama administration approached uh, the problem. And I wanted to get your insights as to whether, you know, what kinds of things did they do that seemed to have either pushed that process further along or whether or not they um, had a strategy of any kind going into it or whether they were simply reacting to events as they were unfolding? Well, let me start. Uh, David covered the uh, events very, very carefully for the New York Times and I think can give you a much uh, closer read of the evolution of the administration's thinking. But uh, from my standpoint, uh, I regret to say that I think uh, the Obama administration has yet to really come to grips with a uh, and develop a, a broader strategy to deal with uh, what is truly a, a, an historic, obviously all the words you can imagine, event in the Middle East, analogous, people say, to 1989 in Eastern Europe. I, d I don't like those sorts of analogies because Eastern Europe and the Middle East are so different. But the point being that uh, democratic change, liberalization is happening on a on a region-wide level uh, in, in, in a profound way. Now, I say they, they've had difficulty for several reasons. Uh, number one, I think if, uh, again, I'm, I'm now an observer and I can be much more candid than I used to be, I think it's fair to say that President Obama and his team uh, did not believe very much in democratic change in the Middle East. Uh, it's one of the sad truths that in the case of Egypt specifically, uh, the administration had put aside the issue of uh, democratic uh, evolution in, in Egypt in favor of uh, working more and more closely with President Mubarak. The choice of Cairo as the place for the president's speech was a, a large and significant ratification of the relationship with President Mubarak, regardless of what was said in the speech, and most importantly, um, the programs, the actual programs that were put in place by uh, the previous administration, which believed very strongly in democratic change in the Middle East, were eliminated uh, in large part, at least cut in half, and the ones that were remaining, uh, and, I, and this is, these are, as I understand them, simple budgetary realities. Uh, were programs that uh, would allow for assistance to go to democratic groups chosen and selected and approved by the Mubarak government. So democratic change in Egypt was not the, a big priority for President Obama. I think uh, he obviously uh, was reacting to the uh, disastrous effect of, of making democracy the the uh, rationale for the Iraq war and all of its consequences. And like these things tend to happen in Washington, the pendulum swings too far in one direction, and then it swings too far in the other direction. And so I think that was their biggest problem, is that they weren't prepared for it. They didn't support it, broadly speaking, as a priority for the administration. And then when, when it came, and it came for real, um, there is, unfortunately, uh, in this uh, modern era, and I think this team in particular, a, a, a highly uh, political and, and press focus in the White House where power has been concentrated to a very, very large degree in foreign affairs. Uh, and the focus on the news cycle is a, a remarkable uh, uh, phenomenon in, in the national security policy making. And so you get caught with these news cycle uh, victories and defeats and ups and downs, and that tends to lead to a perception of, of, uh, of uh, lacking an overall strategy. And finally, I think the biggest blunder, and this is in the nature of a blunder, uh, was the handling of President Mubarak. I think it's obvious to everyone it was time for him to go. The people 
we're not going to accept anything short of that. But uh, we are paying a very, very heavy price with important uh, countries in the region because of the way it was done. And I think it would have been quite easy and quite simple, and, and that's why I call it a blunder, to have a statement, and I could imagine writing such a statement, of praise uh, for President Mubarak for all the uh, contributions he's made to peace in the Middle East, uh, to being a bulwark against Iran, to fighting al-Qaeda, even as you let him go. It's not that hard to do. Po that's what politicians are supposed to do, is find a gentle way to let their friends uh, deal with reality. That didn't happen. And the failure to, to make the, our other friends and allies see that we were going to treat a man like this with respect, who obviously, as we can see, made decisions very, very different than other leaders in the Middle East. And, um, and so I think it was difficult to get it right. They weren't prepared for democracy in the Middle East because they had deprioritized it. Uh, and they really mishandled the Mubarak account individually. Now, do you think that there's a, a fair criticism that as the um, Bush 43 administration was ABC anything but Clinton, that the Obama administration was anything but Bush, and that this dismantling of democracy promotion um, created a situation in which they, on the one hand, were not necessarily particularly interested in democracy promotion, saw Bush 41's realist view of the world as the way in which to go when creating problems for friends like Mubarak in Egypt, and then found themselves trying to run to the front of the parade? Is that I, a fair I, I set think, of criticism? I think that you could probably <coughs> put together three criticisms of how this went, and I think Jamie uh, got us rolling on, on several, and some were short-term and some were long-term. First of all, when any new administration comes in, uh, they go out of their way to differentiate themselves from the previous administration. And in fact, I was White House correspondent when President Bush came in, and for example, for years, nobody in the White House press room, official representing the White House, would use the word globalization because they felt that Jamie and his colleagues <laughs> used it all the time. They finally, by the second term, came around to it. You'll, you may remember that on Mideast policy, they walked completely away from the Clinton administration. So not an unusual thing to do. In the case of President Obama, um, what strikes me covering uh, this administration uh, is that I don't think I have ever seen a more pragmatic administration with all the good and all the bad that there is about that uh, in action quite as much as, as the Obama team. Um, can I ask one question sure. about what that pragmatism means? That, that's where, okay. that's where, where, uh, where he was going. Uh, okay. just, just where I was going. Uh, so um, let's see if I can, if I can lay that out. Um, I think that they believed that the freedom agenda that President Bush laid out, and which is in fact sort of the, the theme of his presidential library, was an outcropping of the very ideological nature of the Bush presidency. And I think that is part of why they ran away from it. And certainly it was part of that ideology. But at the same time, there is a long history of democracy promotion on the part of both Democrats and Republicans at various moments in American history uh, from Teddy Roosevelt's time forward. And I think that they let the pragmatic side, which is what do we need to get done out of these individual countries, um, overwhelm their thinking. And I think as a result, they didn't see this coming. I think there was a second factor in play here, which was that the intelligence agencies, once Tunisia started, were asked to come up with an assessment of whether or not this could spread to places like, say, Egypt. And the answer that uh, came back to President Obama was maybe a 20% chance it would spread. Now, what's interesting is I've tried this out on other countries, the Europeans, the Israelis. The Israeli assessment was also about 20%. So I'm not sure that proximity necessarily led to 
a better intelligence assessment. Then a third thing happened, and Jamie's seen this happen inside in government in a way that I never have, so he's probably be in a better position to comment on it. Old think is the first thing you have when you see new events. So the Obama administration was very slow to recognize, or at least slow in the Twitter age, to recognize the speed at which this was all changing. So on the first day of the big protests, or the first days, Secretary Clinton came out and said, Egypt is stable, and President Mubarak is interested in reform. Now, a week later, nobody in Washington would have uttered those two sentences together. The day after that, asked whether or not President Mubarak was a dictator, Vice President uh, Biden declined to answer the question, didn't make an assessment. What changed their view? What changed their view were two really bad conversations between President Mubarak and President Obama, where President Obama was urging President Mubarak, at least in the White House telling of these events, and it's always a little bit risky knowing exactly what the conversations were like, uh, to make very major changes. And in the second conversation, all but said to him that he needed to establish a clear pathway for transition to power. And President Mubarak instead came back and described how this was all a foreign plot, how Nasser had gone through something similar, and in their last conversation, I'm sure it will have been their last conversation ever, uh, President Mubarak said to President Obama, basically, give me a few weeks, this will all go away. It was at that moment that the Obama administration changed. I think it was because those conversations were so bad that they couldn't quite figure out how to write that statement you were talking about. But is this an indication of um, tactics rather than a de dedication to tactics rather than having a strategy of how to deal with first Egypt and now, obviously, since it's spread elsewhere, as to what that overarching strategy is going to be? Well, I think that. You know, all of us have been searching for an Obama doctrine out of, out of this set of events. And the White House itself will say that there isn't an overarching doctrine. In fact, I think they will sort of admit to not having a strategy that fits the whole um, region. Now, partly that is because uh, what's clear from as we've, as we've watched President Obama deal with these is that he has been in support of long-term allies who he thought could bring stability to the region. And when he's come to the determination that they are now a source of instability rather than one of stability, he has turned on them fairly fast. That's certainly what happened with President Mubarak. And that once he determined that Mubarak staying would lead to a more uh, instable, unstable Egypt than Mubarak uh, uh, leaving, he pulled his support. Last weekend, we saw this happen in Yemen. You know, there's no leader of a foreign country that either the Bush administration or the Obama administration has stuck with more than President Saleh in Yemen. But as of last weekend, they basically came to the conclusion that Saleh had to go and made that abundantly evident to us. And I think we wrote a fairly lengthy front page story about it in Monday's paper. Um, so what lesson do foreign leaders get out of this? They get nervous. The Saudis had been on the phone to the White House, including to President Obama, making the case during the Egypt uprising that President Obama needed to stick with Mubarak, even if Mubarak was, went out and shot the protesters. This surprised many in the White House, who did not think that this was perhaps the most tenable political uh, approach. Now, the White House has had to decide what you do about Bahrain. Because do you go out and call for real change there at a moment that the Saudis have come in in support of the Bahraini government? And so where does the US find its strategy at this point? Well, first of all, uh, again, I, I defer to David on, the, on some of these specifics. But having, having worked in the administration uh, that had its own share of difficulties explaining policies, 
I would urge people to be cautious about what White House officials say happened in calls between their man and the other guy's man. Um, and what happens is, especially this White House, where, as I, again, as I said... You're not suggesting we don't always get the full story yeah. on that, do you? <laughs> um, especially in this case, where, where the White House is, has such a high uh, component of, of what you would, I think, fairly call political advisors in the top positions of, of national security making. In fact, I think there's never been a, a more small p political foreign policy team than this group, simply by virtue of the fact that three of them are senators, Biden, uh, Clinton, and the president were senators. So their approach to foreign policy making is very political. And they've had their aides, political aides, uh, in the White House have this high quotient. So that makes this, you know, our guy, their guy, uh, and it, it perhaps creates the dynamic that would not, would allow Mubarak to, to go without thinking through the consequences of not having a, um, a, a perception grow that we throw our allies under the bus when it's convenient. And there is real da danger to that. And we're paying, uh, right now, uh, Secretary of Defense Gates had to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the King of Saudi Arabia using all of his uh, years of, of links to the Saudis to try to pull this relationship out from what is clearly the worst position it's been in in a long time. Now, what we are dealing with right now is a time when the President of the United States has said very loudly and clearly that he doesn't see our role as to be the leader that he worries about our involvement infecting the, uh, the developments on the ground to the negative uh, of the protesters or the people uh, conducting the, the demonstrations, that somehow American support, statements, involvement is going to make things worse. I think people who, uh, who say that are overstating from a, a previous era, the, the stain that comes with American uh, involvement. I think what's remarkable about these events, and let's face it, we're here at, at Yeshiva uh, University, and it's a place where obviously the issue of Israel and, and people's perceptions towards Israel matter a lot. Uh, former ambassador to Israel, Dan Kurtzer, and to Egypt, frankly, uh, was a, a, an alumnus of, of this uh, institution. Um, there isn't a lot of anti-American, anti-Israel, anti-Western uh, 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 aspect to these hundreds of thousands of people across the region. No flags burning. Insignificant references to, to Israel in all of these demonstrations. And so I think what that tells you is, is that um, the worry that American involvement would somehow have a negative effect, I think, is, is wrong. And so therefore, I think we should and can have a strategy for this. We can and should not worry that uh, speaking loudly, speaking clearly, saying what our goals are and our things we want to see not happen are, will somehow harm the cause of democratization in the Middle East. I think that's a wrong judgment. Uh, I know it's made well-intentioned that we don't want to harm it, but I think it's the wrong judgment. Similarly, it's happening at a time where the administration is very proudly telling David and his colleagues and the world that the United States is taking a back seat to Europe on Libya. So here we have a, a fairly significant use of military power. We have NATO engaged, the alliance the United States created, led, and nurtured for, for more than 50 years, its credibility at stake. And NATO is effectively led by Americans. And we're saying, oh, I don't know what's going to happen in Libya. It's over to, over to you, NATO. And I think both of those issues where we're worried about our involvement and the handing off of, of Libya to NATO reflect a desire not to have a strategy.
But there is one. There is, it's possible to create a strategy. It would be complicated. It would have to differentiate between countries like Syria and, and Jordan, say, in a certain category, Saudi Arabia and Morocco in another category, uh, Bahrain perhaps in a category uh, with Syria because of ethnic uh, difficult, uh, differences, uh, Libya obviously all its own, uh, Syria obviously all its own. But the, the, the goal should be to promote democratic change, to use the links between these countries uh, to uh, encourage more and more democratic change and to uh, obviously weigh the degree to which a country is an important and friend and a responsible player in the international community, which Bahrain has been in judging how they deal with their, uh, their problems. But, but we are not, all, all we'll say is, oh, we have a strategy, we're, we're for universal values. And other than that, we want the demonstrators to have the freedom to act without being infected by the United States. And I think uh, that pragmatism, which is what drives it, is, uh, is unfortunate at a, at a time in which uh, the, the world needs to leadership because we've learned over and over again when European countries try to figure out how to do things and argue over who's in charge and argue over how it gets done, it tends not to get done really well, especially when it comes to the use of force. And when these momentous changes are occurring in places that really do matter to the United States, both for our own national security interest and the interest of our friends like Israel. And should the distinction be made between friends and adversaries as to what the position of the United States should be? Because an argument can be made for the case of Syria, for example, that as, as bad of a regime as Assad's uh, regime is, that, and this is one of those instances because of the ethnic tensions that that can exist within Syria, in which the chaos that could ensue with the breakdown of uh, a dictatorship that could look more like what happened in Iraq rather than what happened in Egypt. Well, you know, people do worry about that. I, I've heard that argument uh, made very uh, uh, much along those lines. But let's remember what's really going on here. This is a, a very serious police state. Uh, I've been there a few times. The last time I, I was in Aleppo uh, met, meeting with Bashar Assad and his wife as a, when in my role as journalist. I did an hour-long interview with them for Sky News. Uh, you know, and they'll say all the right things, and his wife is gorgeous and, and modern and uh, friendly and uh, Western oriented and and he'll sit there and tell you why everything's being done and all that's can be done but we're dealing with a police state that has uh, you know a, a kind of a mafia like component in certain areas of its economy uh, obviously uh, a small group uh, eight percent nine percent of the public uh, are Alawi, uh, Alawite, and they rule the others. And these people in a police state, thousands of them are standing up in the most, I would say, analogous to the Soviet Union, the likelihood of being shot or killed or tortured or harmed. Uh, they are choosing bravely to stand up and, and try to see whether the change can come there too. And so the last thing I'd want to do is, is worry that, oh, well, maybe, maybe, maybe if, if we support that, it, it might devolve into, a, into an Iraq scenario. Uh, there, we've tried very hard to work with Syria, I think, and still hope that someday soon we could try to negotiate uh, the Syria track, which is the, the aspect of the Middle East peace process we really haven't worked very hard on recently. But, um, you know, this thing is going to last for a long time. It started, the flame has been lit there, uh, people have been killed, their families are angry, their friends are angry, and every Friday, every other day of a funeral, they are braving the most brutal uh, uh, police tactics and, and standing up. So I, I think it's going to continue, and I, uh, I recognize the risks, but 
I think this is clearly not a case for us to discourage uh, that kind of, uh, of, of evolution. And, and I think the risks of Syria staying exactly as they are and causing great, great damage to the, the region and, and their own people are far worse than the risks of, of uh, chaos. Uh, but remember, Iraq's chaos grew out of an occupation by you know, a foreign army of 200,000 nearly troops. So we're obviously not going to do that, and nobody's suggesting that we are. And so you're right about the ethnic makeup, but I just don't think it would have the same quality to it. Um, David, your paper has written quite a bit about the internal debates in the administration over uh, Libya um, and what seems to be some pretty sharp divides. Um, I was wondering if you could sure. talk a bit about that. You know, governments, like all of us in our individual lives, are influenced, maybe over-influenced, by the last mistake we made. I know I am, okay? And in the case of the Obama administration and Libya, there were two competing mistakes that were sitting in the backs of people's minds. The first one comes uh, from the Clinton administration, a time that uh, Jamie uh, no doubt remembers well, uh, when the Clinton administration decided not to go into Rwanda. And when you think about the people who were critical to the decision in Libya, they had all been around for that conversation. Um, Susan Rice, the uh, American ambassador, uh, permanent representative at the UN. Uh, Samantha Power, who wrote a, a, a book that was um, quite damning of how the United States dealt with this uh, issue. And Hillary Clinton, who watched her husband go through this and uh, uh, certainly uh, heard all of these conversations underway. And President Clinton himself has said that his greatest regret of his presidency came out of the Rwanda experience. So that was one set of bruises. And then came the Obama administration's analysis of what the United States did wrong in the Iraq war. And it's very similar to the one you just heard from Jamie, that by going in with ground troops, we did two things. First, by engineering the regime change in Washington, Washington became blamed for everything that followed. This was the you, you break it, you own it concept. The second thing was, once you put ground troops in, mission creep sets in very quickly. What you thought you could do with 50,000 troops becomes what you can do with 100,000 troops, becomes what you can do with 150,000 troops. And there's always an argument for not leaving, because as soon as you leave, the situation may go back to one of chaos. It's the concern that the United States now has about Afghanistan. And as of uh, the end of this year, the United States will have been in Afghanistan a decade, something I don't believe any of us would have expected 10 years ago uh, here, even in the worst days after 9-11. Um, so those were the two competing factors. And then there was a third factor, which I uh, wrote about some in last Sunday's paper, which was that during the Situation Room debate about what to do in Libya, and the most interesting debate took place in the afternoon of March 15th, so remarkably only uh, uh, a few more than 20 days ago, it tells you how fast these all move. There was a lot of concern about how the Iranians would view an American decision to stay out of Libya. After all, the President of the United States had said publicly that it was American policy that Gaddafi should go. And if the U.S. didn't back that up with real action, the lesson the Iranians might emerge from with that is that this is a President who's not willing to use military force under any circumstances, perhaps including to back up his other statement that Iran would never be permitted to build a nuclear weapons capability. Now, I'm not saying that Iran was the reason that they went into Libya, but it was a supporting reason. It was in the, it was in the background. The main reason was a responsibility to protect. So what did the president do? He went in somewhat reluctantly. He said a few things. First, the U.S. will contribute unique power, its unique 
capabilities. And that means intelligence capabilities and Tomahawk missiles and other uh, equipment that the U.S. had that NATO really did not have. And this was used to knock out the air defenses. The second thing the president said was the U.S. would not go in on the ground. That was learning from the Iraq lesson. And the third thing he said was that the U.S. would only participate at the beginning and then let NATO pick it up, just as Jamie has said. And this has led to uh, a sense in Europe that the U.S. was the most reluctant partner. The White House sense of this is if the Europeans are going to learn how to make NATO an effective fighting force, the U.S. has to sort of step back and let them do what the French, in this case, were the most eager to do, which was get this thing going. How will this turn out? Well, if it ends in a stalemate in which Gaddafi stays, I think the president may be in a pretty tough spot because he will be criticized for having gone in too late and then not going in with enough force. In other words, having violated the Powell Doctrine. Right? If two months from now Gaddafi can't take it anymore and he leaves, then the president will be able to stand up and say the U.S. does not have to be in the lead on all of these things. Jamie was making the case, I believe, that it is harmful to the perception of American power that the U.S. has stepped back this far and is not in leadership position. And he may well turn out to be exactly right on that. I suspect it's too early to tell uh, because if Gaddafi does leave, and I'm not at all persuaded right now that he's not going to just stick there and you know, fight, it to, fight to the finish, I suspect he will, um, uh, then I think American power may well be questioned around the, uh, uh, around the, uh, the NATO table for a long time. Um, before I turn over to Jamie Rubin, there were index cards that were distributed to people as they came in. If you have questions, please um, pass them to the aisles. And the students who have been working this event, if they could bring them forward, and we can start um, asking questions from the audience, I would appreciate it if you'd like to pick up on that. Yes. Again, um, I, I get my information from the newspaper, mostly from David's articles. Um, Boy, are you in trouble. <laughs> um, but the argument about Iran, if that's really a motivating factor, um, it would seem to me that uh, that's going to apply every day going forward because Gaddafi's still there. We're not participating in a significant way, and if that was the argument for using force initially, I think by the time uh, this issue is resolved, the Iranians certainly will not believe that we would use military power to stop them from uh, actually brandishing a, a nuclear weapon because we said Gaddafi should go and we are reluctant even to uh, conduct a, a training and arming of, of the opposition, uh, let alone uh, continue the airstrikes or use additional force. Sure, it would be nice if the European component of NATO, and remember, this is a really unique time, and I, I know this may seem obscure and Cold Warish to some of you here, but there was a long time for decades and decades where we wanted to see the French and the other Europeans play a role alongside us in NATO, not in anything else that they wanted, where they wanted to have a, their own European security system or their own uh, EU force or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The French have now done what we have hoped they would do for a long time, rejoin the military committee of NATO, participate in the organization that Charles de Gaulle, you know, uh, essentially took them out of at the crucial time. And we have a French leader who wants to work very, very closely with America to achieve similar objections. Think of where we are. I, I can imagine in this audience, take yourself back five, six years, think about France, think about what you and your family members might have been saying to each other about France. Uh, about drinking French wine, eating French fries, uh, doing things French. Well, now the French and the United States 
have switched positions. Think about this. America has taken the view that we should not go into uh, uh, Libya in the absence of a UN resolution authorizing such an action. The French took the view that they were going to go with or without a UN resolution. What does that sound like? The position of President Bush that was criticized by Jacques Chirac. So things have gotten very, very strange around the European-American table. And, and I worry that although Europe is not uh, filled with the kind of problems of, of uh, the Balkans in the 90s or the need for their support the way we needed it in Iraq during the Bush administration, that as you can see now in Libya, when something hard has to be done, it looks like it's American and Europe that need to be involved. And so all of this talk about India and China, et cetera, et cetera, which obviously are strategic issues of a different category, doesn't matter very much. And you have to go back to your allies, to your friends, if you want to do something. And your friends are in Europe. Now, unfortunately, the United States, the British, and the French are not working very closely together. It's a very different era from the Clinton years or the Bush years where President Bush and Tony Blair uh, were working closely together. It's a very different era with Sarkozy there and Chirac not there. And so what I worry about is that we have a great opportunity to work closely with European leaders who want America to play a leading role, who want the United States and France to together do things that we both say we want to do. Now, Sarkozy may do it in his dramatic Sarkozy way, but it's better than them not wanting to do anything and having to be dragged kicking and screaming to allow the United States to do what we think is important. So what I worry is, is again, the pendulum has swung too far in the other direction. And I don't believe that France and Britain, it's, you know, the White House may want to have a nice experiment here, but the, the, the credibility of the United States the future of a country that has some significance, whose people we've now committed to protect, um, and potentially the future of uh, the Middle Eastern spring, whatever you want to call it, is at stake here. And we're engaged in experimenting whether the Europeans can really do it. It reminds me of, of what President uh, Bush the first under James Baker, James Baker said, well, let's have those Europeans figure out Bosnia. And, and it's, we don't have any dog in that fight in 1991. And they say they have an EU. They want to do it. Let's see how that EU works. That's what we said. And uh, you know, many, many years, many hundreds of thousands of dead people later, many, much, much damage to the United States credibility under both President Bush and President Clinton. Uh, we needed to get involved because those European countries couldn't actually follow through on the policy that we wanted to see them uh, done. They're not, uh, I was at a, the same event and the British aren't arming the rebels, the French aren't arming the rebels. I don't know who Secretary of Gates was talking about when he said, let the other countries do it. They're not going to do it without our involvement at some level. So there will be a stalemate. The British and French-led operation is not going to coordinate military operations with the opposition in Libya. There will be a stalemate. Now, again, people may want to experiment and then be able to say, see, I told you it didn't work when you guys did it. But, but this is the real world. This isn't a think tank where we get to have experiments. No, I, I think something that Jamie has touched on here is a huge debate not brought out, not really surfaced by the White House terribly explicitly, about how Libya captures the argument about whether American foreign policy is driven by our values or by our interests. So the President went in because our values are to protect the Libyan people against their own leaders, which is also what the UN resolution said. But as Secretary Gates said repeatedly in front of Congress, 
Libya is not a vital strategic interest to the United States, vital being the critical question uh, here. And he used that as the argument that, therefore, the U.S. should not be overly committing troops. And so now, a mere 20 days later, we are stuck in this discussion of, if it's not a vital interest, can you just go in for a while and then hand it off, as, as Jamie has said, and preserve your powder for what is a, a vital interest in the Middle East, which would be Israel or Egypt or Iran or Saudi Arabia, countries where the vital strategic interest to the U.S. doesn't really need to be explained. What's interesting is when you look at polls of the American people, most American people, and the, the polls are somewhat contradictory on this, don't seem to regard Libya as a vital case for the U.S. either. Jamie's made the argument, I think quite persuasively here, that while Libya itself may not be, what the impact in the region and with our allies is, is a vital American interest. Now, there, there have been a number of questions um, from the audience actually relating to um, one of those strategic interests um, that you had mentioned, which is in 2009, an election took place in Iran that then resulted in massive street protests that um, called for major reform, that protested what was seen as an illegitimate election. The government responded with a great deal of force, kicked journalists out, very similar type of uh, scenario as to what we've seen. And the United States position had been to sit on its hands. So the question is, it, did the United States do the right thing then? And if there is some repeat of this, if there is, you know, some have suggested that by what is happening in the Arab world, Iranians will view this and say, it is now time again to resume these protests. What does the United States do, or what should the United States well, do? Well, let me address that uh, very directly. I think, uh, in retrospect, and I also thought at the time, we, we obviously didn't handle the uprising in Iran very well at the time. It was early in the administration. I think uh, if you, uh, from partly what David has said here tonight and, and, and my own assessment of this, the idea of Iran getting a nuclear weapon has been, if anything has been, the organizing principle of the Obama foreign policy. And they believed early on that there was a chance to negotiate an outcome uh, that would have delayed or perhaps prevented that uh, with the regime. And they went to great lengths to express respect for the government of Iran by recognizing the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran, using the phrase, I are Islamic Republic of Iran. And um, they again used the argument, we don't want to infect the protesters with our support. But I think the real reason, this is again a judgment, I don't know this to be true, was that they uh, were, did not want to risk uh, interfering what was a still at that time perceived to be a chance to negotiate an outcome on the nuclear issue. Um, there also was uh, a phenomenon at the time of, of, you know, these, and this is where I, I concluded that they really have a concentrated power in the White House to a m remarkable degree. During those uh, demonstrations, uh, American policy was made by interview. When President Obama did an interview with one station, that was U.S. policy, and they waited a day, and then he interviewed with another TV station, and that was U.S. policy. And the President was doing a series of uh, evolutions from during that week to the end where I think he got to a pretty good place in how to talk about it. But it took seven, uh, perhaps, I'm exaggerating, but several tries to, to get it right. And that's an unusual development. Normally that's the task of the Secretary of State. Uh, the President would sit back and uh, allow commenting on a de development overseas to be done by the Secretary of State. Um, but obviously that didn't happen. Now. Unfortunately, what we see in the Middle East in these uh, uh, uprisings is the, the different factors that play into success. And the crucial factor 
is the willingness of the security forces to shoot and kill the protesters, whether that is uh, in Libya, in Bahrain, uh, in Syria versus Egypt and Tunisia. It's not that complicated. You have on the one side the willingness of people to stand up for their rights and risk uh, uh, being a, you know, arrested or tortured or killed. And on the other hand, the number of people for the regime willing to pull the trigger, order the trigger to be pulled, follow those orders, and carry it out. Unfortunately, the country with the most number of people willing to uh, follow that order is Iran with the uh, besieged forces, uh, volunteer forces, and the Republican uh, uh, Revolutionary Guard forces, we're talking about tens of thousands of people willing to kill their fellow Iranians. In Egypt, they wouldn't. In Tunisia, they wouldn't. In Libya, uh, and maybe not in Bahrain, so they brought the Saudis in just to be sure that they would have enough uh, in case they needed it. And so that's one crucial factor. And the second one, and I say this as someone who hopes that someday, some way, somehow, something happens in Iran that brings greater freedom to those people, they've been through a lot. And I don't think they, as a population right now in this time, at this moment in history, are prepared to die in large numbers. Uh, having gone through the Iranian Revolution and gone through the Iran-Iraq War, where really enormous numbers of people died. I, I forget the exact proportion, but in terms of men, it would be in the United States the equivalent of losing 20, 30, 40 million Americans were lost in the Iran-Iraq War. And, and the young people and, the, and others, for those two reasons, the Iran-Iraq War and the, the recent 79 revolution and all the death and pain and horror that came from that when they thought it was going to bring them something wonderful, many of them, um, I don't think, given those tens of thousands prepared to shoot, there are enough prepared to die. And until that number gets the right balance, uh, we're stuck with the uh, Ahmadinejad as president, Khamenei as the leader, and the people behind the scenes in their consensus government, regardless of what the United States says or does. And do you think that there is a change in the way in which the United States is going to view something happening again in Iran since the offers that were made by the Obama administration early in the administration of dialogue and uh, trying to um, engage the, the Iranian government. Is that, since that, that stage has obviously ended, is there going to be a different reaction, do you think, from the Obama administration? Uh, I suspect they will because I think many in the administration now regret the way they responded after the June 12 election in 2009. Uh, they believed at the time uh, both that there still was a faint hope of negotiation. That really ended with, the, with uh, that election. But they think they were also concerned, and probably are still concerned, that if they supported the Green Movement in Iran, it would make it easier for the Ayatollahs uh, to step out and declare that the Green Movement were just um, lackeys of the Americans. And uh, in the end, I suspect it doesn't make any particular difference because the Iranians put that movement down so strongly that until a few months ago, we had basically all left the movement for dead. You had heard very little from it. Then after Egypt, something fascinating happened. A group of the protesters turned out, since the Iranian government had said, had welcomed the Egyptian uprising and said that it would give the opportunity to turn Egypt into an Islamic state, have its own Islamic revolution the way Iran did, uh, a number of the very wily protesters in Iran stood up and said, yes, the government's right. We really should stage a protest in support of our Egyptian brothers and sisters who are out on the street. Well, this idea lasted for about 48 hours until the Iranians figured out what this protest was really all about. And when those protests did start, 
in a very small way. They were put down by the Basij and by the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps very strongly, and you've not heard much from them since. So I suspect that the moment has probably passed for a while. I think you could argue that the Arab uprising may have actually, oddly enough, begun in a non-Arab state, that it began in Iran uh, in 2009, that there was a delayed reaction. And now the question is, can it come full cycle and reinfect Iran? But the good news, by the way, and, and I think we're both agreeing quite pessimistically, but the good news is Ahmadinejad had a constituency in the Arab world for a while there by virtue of his anti-Americanism and his whole uh, style of standing up to the great West and the United States, etc. I think the democratic change in the Arab world has eliminated that uh, constituency, that you know, soft power that he might have had when they have seen Iran crack down on their protesters, put them in prison, all the horror stories, while in the Arab world so many people are getting a chance to to speak. So right. I think he's lost enormous credibility. I, I think that's right. And, you know, this actually brings us back to something you opened with, which was WikiLeaks. Um, one, the Arab press had written very little about the Iranian nuclear program prior to WikiLeaks, because they weren't quite sure how to deal with it, for all the reasons that you just described. Once they read that their own leaders were quite concerned about the Iranian nuclear program, for a while, and this was completely overrun once the Arab uprisings began, for a while, you started actually reading interesting stories about the Iranian nuclear program in the Arab press. And I think that was part of exactly what you were just describing. Now, that moment's gone away. And I think one of the big issues in the Mideast is going to be, as, as Jamie said, the Iranian nuclear program was the organizing principle of Mideast policy for the Obama administration. And the question is, will it reemerge as one, or is the Arab Spring going to end up so distracting American time, American efforts, American diplomacy, that in fact, it may give the Iranians some breathing room to start up again. Well, some of the questions are um, assuming that this is maybe the first act in a multi-act play. And so Egypt is going to be heading toward elections. And it seems that there is a possibility, at least, that one of the political parties or movements is going to do particularly well in that election is going to be the Muslim Brotherhood. And so the question then becomes, so what is the end point of this? And despite or the, I guess, the conflicted feelings that some may have about what is happening in the, in the Arab world is first there might be this reaction of, yes, it's time to um, shed oneself of these dictators, but once we move to elections, in many of these countries in which civil society has been suppressed, where political parties have been banned, where people have not had the ability to organize, and the only thing that is left that had some space in which to organize, Mosque. Yeah. yeah. What, is, what is that then going to mean? Well, uh, clearly this is a concern of a lot of people. Uh, it's obviously a major concern uh, in Israel. I think it's a remarkable and unfortunate thing that in Israel they've had such a conflicted reaction to democratic change. Um, I think, uh, you know, to see the Israeli Haaretz versus some of the other papers try to come to grips with what does it mean to have our neighbor Egypt uh, de move into a democratic uh, category is it's a, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, and, and I say that because, you know, we used to hear uh, it's such a cold peace with Egypt. And I think we're forgetting that when the uh, system cracks and the press uh, restrictions crack and we begin to have some checks and balances in a system and a free, freer press, uh, not manipulated by the elites to, to keep uh, a certain uh, faction in power, uh, and you have uh, the potential for really proper coverage of, of factual issues in that part of the world,
I think what you're going to discover is that the peace with Egypt can become warmer. And I know that may not be much comfort to a lot of people in this room or even in Israel, but I think they're misreading it. And that uh, the Israel has, has basically had a peace agreement with about three guys. Um, you know, the leader of Egypt, I'm exaggerating to make my point, uh, the leader of Jordan, um, and de facto some individuals in, in who won't have their country speak publicly, like certain times Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and others. Um, but they live in a neighborhood, and they talk about it a lot, that is filled with all these other people. And some of these other people have now done things that we are all and should be thrilled by and proud of in, in parts of, of Egypt in the Tahrir Square Revolution. Now, will it evolve into the kind of you know, uh, future that we all hope for? And it's going to have a Muslim component. These are Islamic peoples. Okay, it's it's going to be Muslim, and you know that's a reality. The question is, to what degree do those Muslim parties uh, uh, see themselves in the model of of a Turkey or in the model of an Iran? Um, and I think uh, in Egypt, there's every reason to be hopeful that with good policy making on the U.S. government's part and Israel's part and uh, uh, others, that if we establish uh, a dialogue with civil society and leaders of the parties as we should, and we lay down our policies, our red lines, for groups like the Muslim Brotherhood that relate to, you know, living, not renouncing, renouncing the Camp David Accords, not uh, renouncing elections after they win the first one, um, etc. All the obvious points you can imagine, not um, um, creating uh, a, you know, supporting the Hamas and Gaza, the things that, that we uh, and, and the Israelis care most about, but otherwise encouraging democratic change. You know, we better get in front of it, because uh, it's going to happen anyway. And to sit here and lament and say, oh my God, they're, they're Muslims, um, is not realistic. Uh, it's happening. The change is coming. Uh, the parts of the world that, that uh, Israel should and does care about in Egypt, uh, we haven't talked about Jordan yet, but in Egypt is going to be different. But I, I believe there's a chance for it to be a warmer peace. It was very cold. And a more sustainable peace uh, than the one that has exi existed up to now. And obviously... Uh, let me just play you know, devil's advocate. Doesn't that presuppose that those that end up winning, regardless of whether they're Muslims, that they are somehow liberals in, 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 in some sense of the word? And because it's, it's, um, it's not an exaggeration to say that the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt is going to have serious problems, even with a cold peace uh, with Israel. And that, you know... I agree with that. And, and, and that in North Africa, there's actually been a previous experience of tensions between, let's say, a more secularized army and... Algeria, uh, yes. You mean. Well, yes, but the, the Egypt is not Algeria. I think that's a pretty big difference. Uh, I think what we've seen that has brought on the revolution is a of a, of a wholly different character than what happened in Algeria of, you know, the extremist uh, Islamic parties trying to have elections occur one time. I think was that's where the idea of one man one vote one time phrase first came from in Algeria. I think, you know, we should look at what happened in Egypt and, and yes, we should be cautious, but we should see it for what it was. It was not anti-American. It was pro-American. They were angry that Obama wasn't more supportive of them. It was not anti-Israel. There were, as I'm told, you know, of all the thousands and thousands of signs, there were one or two that referred to Mubarak's support for the Camp David Accords. It was remarkable. There, and, and, you know, we can either, you know, there wasn't any curtain to look behind. 
It all happened in front of us. Now, yes, we should be careful, and we have to watch what happens, but the Egyptian army is the institution the United States has the closest relationship with uh, at a very deep level of training and support and obviously uh, military uh, supplies. And they are ultimately going to be the arbiter of whether this peace is real or not. And I think we have every reason to believe that they don't want to uh, change what has been Egyptian policy. And I think we also know that, yes, there is a Muslim Brotherhood there, and it is a party, and it will get a, a substantial chunk. But it, unless, you know, I admit I could be wrong. And I, it's easy for me to say this sitting over here, but I don't think they're going to be the majority party. Um, and I don't think anybody does. And how much is this playing into the Obama administration's thinking about what to do next, both in terms of the elections and also, um, you know, it, if there's going to be concerns that are going to be bilateral between Israel and Egypt, but there's also going to be concerns about what to do about Gaza and Hamas and, you know, especially with the renewal of, of violence that's taken place this week. That's right. Um, well, I think one very important point that Jamie made, which um, is worth underscoring here, uh, and I've had this discussion with Israeli friends and American friends at various points, is the most important thing to think about in terms of what happened in Egypt was that we didn't have a vote on this issue and the Israelis didn't have a vote on this issue. This was going to happen. We just didn't know when and what the triggering event would be. And the fact that the country was run by a very ill 82-year-old with no obvious and credible successor made, I think, a lot of difference here in the calculation that the military went through. Why was it that the military abandoned Mubarak so quickly? Because they looked at him and they concluded he wasn't going to be around for that long. So they tried to get out ahead of the train themselves. And of course, as soon as they did that, the support fell apart. Um, the US does have considerable leverage in Egypt when it comes to the military. That military is wholly dependent, or almost wholly dependent, on the United States for arms, for training, for other forms of aid. That turns out to have been a pretty important investment for the US over these past 20 years, because it meant that when the uprising started, you not only had President Obama in these conversations with President Mubarak, which, as I suggested, weren't terribly fruitful, there were very fruitful conversations and email back and forth between American army officers and their Egyptian counterparts who had trained together at this fort or that fort or been on exercises together and knew each other as human beings. And I think that that had a fair bit to do with the fact that the Egyptian military never opened fire against the protesters. I think that that barrage of messages that week, that critical week, that they should keep it cool, meant something. And I think that that may also continue to pay off as the US tries to win their way through what's going to be a very long and very messy process with lots of setbacks that involves the question you raised about Gaza, the question of whether the peace process, or at least the peace treaty, is durable. And my guess is that the Obama administration will use all of those levers of influence to make the case to the Egyptian military that if that peace process is abandoned or if the peace agreement is abandoned, uh, a lot of that support will go away very quickly and that the U.S. Congress would pull that support. Uh, and so I think that there is good reason to believe that the agreement is likely to hold for some time even if the Muslim uh, Brotherhood has a relatively decent showing in the election, as I suspect they probably will. I, I agree with Jamie that I think the chances of them winning a majority are pretty low right now, at least in the first election. The interesting and harder question is the second election. So one last question, and then we'll call it an evening. Um, a number of people have asked whether or not there has been one other period in history in which there has been a wave of revolutions that took place, and it happened in the 19th century in Europe. 
But what also happened in Europe during that period was there was a revision back to autocracy. And as anyone um, who has studied revolutions would say, you never know how they're going to turn out. And although we may think that at this point all of this is, is looking as if it's heading toward more democratic or possibly more liberal um, forms of government, um, what do you think the prospects are of this backsliding? And what, is it that, what kind of role does the United States play in order to encourage um, a more liberal progress and uh, limit the amount of backsliding? Very good question. Uh, really very good. Uh, and I'm no historian of the middle 1800s and the revolutions against uh, monarchies and, and uh, the Austri uh, Austrian emperor. And, and I kind of missed that section in class. I figured we'd leave that to Henry Kissinger to relive over and over and over and over <laughs> again. He just did it in the New York Times last weekend. Um, the history, I believe, is much more compressed today than it was back then. You know, everything happens faster. By that, that standard, we've had the revolution and the counter-revolution in the first two weeks based on what happened in Bahrain in many respects. Um, and uh, the assertion of control by, by the Saudi Arabian uh, government and kingdom. So, you know, things happen much, much faster now. And yes, Egypt could uh, go uh, south. Things could be worse than they were under Mubarak for Israel, for the United States, for the Egyptians, for the world. I just don't think so. I don't think there's any evidence for drawing that conclusion other than pessimism. And, and uh, often it's a good bet to be a pessimist in foreign affairs. Uh, but I think even people I know who are pessimists in foreign affairs look at Egypt and they can't quite find anything to be pessimistic about because of the nature of the way it changed. You know, th there is a now a relationship between the people who are willing to go out and, and protest in large numbers and change that will happen by their government. And, and that is a new power equation that has never existed in that uh, way uh, in, in that part of the world. And, and if the military, the new system, doesn't make the substantial changes that a large, large number of people expected and wanted, they're going to come out again. And that's kind of, you know, we had the revolution, the counter-revolution, through this process of back and forth uh, over many, many weeks. Um, but the United States has a huge role to play in this moment in history. We are the only country that has an indispensable role in the world, the only country that can galvanize a coalition that will succeed. Uh, France can apparently galvanize a coalition into stalemate, and that's a joke. Um, but, but if we want to succeed, the United States is going to have to lead. We are going to have to get our real friends, the friends we can count on in Europe, working with us. And we're going to have to have a set of policies, differentiated policies for different problems uh, that recognize that none of this, you know, some may believe that, you know, all this stuff happened. I can't figure out whether the Obama administration wants to take credit for their flood of calls from the the military uh, officials to the other ones that they were tracking down on their lists or say that we didn't have any role in this and it was the Egyptians that did it themselves. I can never figure out which, which news cycle they think they're in, that they're either taking credit for, for making historical change or, or denying that America should have a role because we would infect the, the, uh, the, uh, the occasion. I think we have a role, okay? That's my view. And I think we are wrong to, uh, to worry so much about uh, infecting these changes with an American involvement. What we saw, what tools did they use? American tools, Facebook, Google, all these tools developed by Americans in California were the tools these people used. They like those tools, and they know they were created by Americans. They like President Obama for a whole bunch of reasons. There is a role for us to play here. It's hard. 
It will require time. It will require leadership. It will probably require money. What a time to use foreign assistance. If you make an analogy to history, let's use the analogy to, to Eastern Europe in Hungary and the Czech Republic, or then it was Czechoslovakia, where American support called the, uh, I think it was called seed money, support for East European democracy, and then it became freedom support in, in the former Soviet Union, made a difference in the successful evolution of those countries. So it will cost money, it will involve leadership, it will not be easy, it will involve judgments that will have political risks, um, but that's what we ought to do. Will we do it? From what I've heard from David tonight, I, it's hard to be optimistic that we are going to see our role in that way. You have the last word. Well, I think you were right to give a good caution here that um, revolutions, even ones that seem promising at the time they start, have a way of going on and living a life of their own. Had we been at the Yeshiva <laughs> University um, contemporaneous uh, conference on the French Revolution, two months into the French Revolution, um, we might have spent the evening talking about how hopeful it all was. And it, it did have its bad moments. Um, you'll remember that in the first nine months after the Iranian Revolution, there were many in the US government who thought this might turn out all right. After all, the revolution, while it had been uh, sparked by uh, a heavily Islamist movement, and of course, um, the return of uh, Ayatollahs who had long been well, exiled and so forth. There was an early government in place that the U.S. thought it could work with and tried to work with. And in fact, our Secretary of Defense, uh, Robert Gates, was a young diplomat set out in part on one of the last failed missions to go uh, try to do that. Um, actually, I think he, at the time he was working uh, for, the, for the National C Security Council. Uh, he had been uh, sent CIA. over from the CIA, but yeah. it was, was, was uh, uh, Brzezinski's aide at that. Um, so these things are very hard to go predict how they, will, how they will turn out. I think the U.S. does have a big opportunity here to influence these. But that opportunity is going to look very different in many different places. In Egypt, I think there is a lot of it. Uh, I was cringing a little bit when I heard Jamie talk about what an opportunity it was to start up something like the SEED program, not because I think the SEED program wouldn't be a great thing to start up, but you could see the US government shut down tomorrow. And uh, imagine coming back in about two or three months with uh, President Obama's plan for essentially the Marshall Plan for the Middle East so to support democratic, new democratic states. My guess is that the uh, debate on that uh, in Congress would be pretty vivid uh, at this particular moment in our economic history. And that's a concern. Uh, we did not follow up in Afghanistan with anywhere near the kind of Marshall Plan that President Bush promised in March of 2002. Uh, in Iraq, it took a long time before uh, money really got flowing because there had been an assumption that oil would pay for it. Uh, in many of the countries in the Middle East that we're looking at, uh, what they are going to be starting to clamor for in the next few months, and you're hearing the Egyptians do this already, is American investment, but not American interference. And arranging for that is going to be difficult, because you're going to see a lot of companies, I think, that are a lot of multinational companies that are very shy about going into the region in a big way, in a job-creating way, until they have greater certainty about how all of this is going to turn out. And I think one of the biggest challenges for President Obama is going to be uh, whether or not he can organize private capital, because the public capital isn't going to be there, organize private capital to move in and begin to support these democracies. And because uh, if you don't get job creation, we've seen what happens to young democracies. They, they're much easier to hijack with 0 to 1 percent growth than they are with 7 or 8 percent growth. And you know, the model here is China. What enables China 
to keep up the level of repression that's underway, a, a, the unspoken agreement between the Communist Party and the rest of the country that as long as the country is growing at 7 or 8 or 9 percent a year, the populace is not going to cause them big trouble. Well, different dynamic in the Middle East for sure, but you're going to see a lot more trouble if there's stagnant growth than if there's real growth. Just let me just add two short points um, and important points. SEED was a, a very tiny program. It was a technical assistance program. It wasn't a Marshall Plan. No need to cringe about spending a lot of money. Um, secondly, when the President wants to say that national security uh, requires it, money is created so fast in our government you have no idea. During the Bush administration, I think they created a trillion dollars for two wars without a budget battle of any kind. They just did it. By so, never saying it would cost a trillion dollars. <laughs> well, exactly. But, but so money can be created quite quickly um, uh, when, when you need to. And, and I think we, we should um, not be penny wise and pound foolish at, at important moments in history. Well, thank you very much. And before we leave this evening, I just wanted to say to everyone that David Sanger has been kind enough to uh, sign copies of his book, which are actually uh, both The Inheritance and Open Secrets, which will be for sale in the lobby outside. I want to thank David Sanger, Jamie Rubin, and all of you for coming. Thank you. And have a pleasant evening. Thank you.